Hi, welcome to the noise pad. Check out what I have. Something rather unusual. This is a combustion analyzer. Essentially what it is, is it's an instrument with multiple sensors inside of it that can analyze the content of various gases, particularly from combustion agents. It can detect oxygen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxide, and so on. And it has, depending on which sensors it has inside, it can detect different kinds of gases. It's very different than what we normally talk about here on the channel, but the science and engineering of it should be very interesting nonetheless. I picked up this from eBay as a non-working unit. Now, if you look at the bottom of the unit, it does have a few ports. It has two ports over here, which allows you to measure differential pressure. Making differential pressure is really important when you are analyzing and wanting to make sure that exhaust systems of things like boilers are working correctly, because differential pressure tells you if you're going to have proper flow, for example. And then there's an input port here where it can suck air inside from whatever sample you one, it was circulated around inside of the instrument, exposing it to various sensors, and it exits the unit. And then it can tell you the composition of the gas. It has two thermocouple inputs as well. There's a probe that came with it, luckily, so I'll show you that in a second too. It does have a thermal printer in it, so you can basically be doing this on the field, press the print, and you get a printout of the analysis of the combustion you have, which is pretty cool, clearly intended for that kind of application. It has two, uh, three really strong magnets in the back, so you can stick it to the side of a boiler, very ruggedized, obviously created food to be thrown around you know, in toolboxes and in harsh environments. Now the probe, I actually cleaned this by the way, it was really, really dirty. The probe looks like this. And here's the ports of the probe that connect to the back of the unit. So here is where the air gets sucked in. And there's a filter in here. And this filter is pretty important because you don't want particulates getting inside and you want to have enough uh, rope here, or I should say enough pipe here to cool the sample down because you don't want to put hot air inside of it if it's too warm. And at the tip of this, I'll show you that in a second, there's a thermocouple which this connects to, and here is where the pressure is measured. And here's the probe. There it is. You can insert that into wherever the combustion is, and it does have the thermocouple center, and it's as a whole, so air goes through, it sucks negative pressure inside. Very cool and unusual instrument. So I think we should first turn it on and see if it works, if there's anything wrong with it. I suspect the problem is with the sensors, because these sensors do have a lifetime, and we'll talk about the technology in there as well. So let's go. Okay, let's turn it on and see what it does. Here we go. It does seem to power on, and then this indeed model 1500, and uh, there you go, the pump is on. So it's asking me to not insert the, the probe into anything, which makes sense. The pump is rather loud, so it looks like it's going to zero. Let's wait for it to zero and see if it works. Well, it looks like we do have an error. The auto zero failed. Let's go to diagnostics, which I guess is this button. And it says that the O2 sensor has a current error. Well, that's a problem. Unfortunately, these sensors do have a lifetime, and I'm going to talk about the principal operation of these sensors, but it's a good opportunity now to take it apart. So it's interesting to see that when you turn it off, it doesn't turn off immediately, it's purging the sensors. Basically, it assumes that there's some gas in there that you might have been measuring, and it doesn't want to leave that next to the sensors. It basically purges all that air out. Kind of cool to see. And here's what's inside of this instrument. Really different than some of the other instruments we look at because it does have pumps and pipes that have to move gases around and interact somehow with the electronics that make up the rest of the system. So clearly we have room for four sensors, and it's one, two, three, and four, and these two are not populated. These are actually plugs that you can rotate and pull out and put additional sensors. These sensors have a particular standardized form factor that allows them to fit into this. So we do have the oxygen sensor over here, which is not working, of course, and then we have the carbon monoxide sensor here over on the side, which seems to at least not give an error at the moment. Now, if you look at the way this is working, we have a pump over here, and that pump is going to create negative pressure, allowing the gas to enter the unit. And it enters from here, and it enters into this entire acrylic section, which is two parallel plates with channels built into it, allowing the gas to move and pass the membrane of each of the sensors and then exit the instrument as well. And this is how the gas entering gets exposed to the individual sensors, basically passes by each one of them. And you have to run, run the measurement for some time before those measurements settle down. There's also what appears to be a Bluetooth module. The other thing I noticed is that none of these things are actually glued in, like this Bluetooth module is essentially loose, so if you drop this, it can actually pop out. But we also have two other sensors over here, which are for the differential pressure. If you look closely, we can zoom in a little bit further here. We do have a differential pressure sensor over here. It has two inputs, and it basically subtracts the pressure from those. It's a membrane that gives some analog reading proportional to the pressure. And we should have another one here somewhere that measures the pump. There it is, right over here, that measures and ensures that there is sufficient negative pressure present in the system, and you can check for leaks and things like that. So we do have those two. Aside from that, there is no other 
place where the gas inside interacts with the circuitry aside, of course, from the sensors themselves. There is a battery in there as well. The rest of the electronics would be things like providing power to these and digitizing and analog signal conditioning and calibration circuitry and so on. The pump seems to run just directly from whatever is on this board. Nothing unusual. We do have one processor board over here. This processor board drives the LCD directly, so this is some computer that I guess is modularized and they can use across different instruments. We do have the USB and some other accessory port there as well. And here's our thermal printer, which is connected to the main board underneath this ribbon. It actually does not go through here at all. And the battery used to be connected to this. So in terms of design, it's not really that complicated. It's really interesting to see inside of some of these things. But now we're going to see what we can do when we can add any more sensors to this. And of course, replace the broken oxygen one. And so here we are. I did buy a replacement oxygen sensor. So we're going to try it. Hopefully this works. I also bought a nitrogen dioxide and a sulfur dioxide sensor as well to put here and here. But unfortunately, after I bought these, and these were not cheap, I only realized that the E1500 model does not support more than two sensors. It's locked to having only access to two of them. So even if I populate the other two, it wouldn't matter. This wouldn't access them, which is really annoying. Now, interestingly enough, the model 4500 that does support four sensors and the 1500 have the same firmware. So I'm not sure what differentiates them. As far as I can tell, all the hardware required for this thing to have four sensors is there. And maybe it's just a simple jumper somewhere on the board or some resistor that you have to move around or some code programmed in some EEPROM that tells this box, this operating system, which model it even is. Unfortunately, there is no help. This is a really esoteric unit. I couldn't find any information about it. Maybe we'll search for it later. So unfortunately, these cannot be installed despite how expensive they were. So we have to put them aside. But nonetheless, let's hope that at least the replacement oxygen sensor works. So I'm going to install it and try it out. Okay, let's see if we can do this. Just going to remove this connection here, which is the board that connects to the sensor. We can rotate this sensor, I think, and take it out. There you go. There's our old oxygen sensor. Now we're going to put the new one in its place, which is supposed to be actually new. And it should snap. There it is. And we should be able to put this back on there and turn it on. All right, the new sensor is in there, so it's going to go through the same procedure. I didn't really completely close it. It doesn't matter anyway. But uh, let's see if that error goes away. And check it out, it seems to work now. So the oxygen sensor does report 20.6% oxygen of the ambient. It's not connected to anything, which I hope is correct. I certainly hope that the carbon monoxide measurement being zero is correct. And there's a little bit of CO2 in the, at in the atmosphere nearby. I was actually breathing next to it as I was talking and this number does go up. So that does seem to react as well. And there's no temperature measurement because the thermocouple is not connected. But how cool is that? It looks like it's doing something. And I really do want to talk about how this works and maybe even take it apart so we can take a look inside of it. But I also have a water heater and a boiler that we could, you know, measure it and see what it tells us. So how can you make an oxygen sensor? Well, there are actually quite a few ways to do this, each of them with their pros and cons. For example, the oxygen sensor used in vehicles for internal combustion engine, air monitoring, and the quality of the oxygen going in and out is a very different kind of sensor than what we have here. What we have is an electrochemical oxygen sensor. As the name suggests, you're relying on some chemical reaction between oxygen and some agent inside of the sensor to create the appropriate measurement. In this particular case, oxygen flows through the membrane and goes inside of the sensor. And inside of the sensor, there is some kind of an electrolyte, in, for example, potassium hydroxide. And the reaction of the oxygen with potassium hydroxide releases free ions that flow between the electrodes inside of the sensor. And it kind of kind of behaves like a battery in some way. And then you're trying to measure that current, and that current is proportional to the absorbed oxygen and therefore proportional to the concentration of the oxygen present at the sensor. Now, right away, there are, of course, disadvantages to this kind of sensor. First of all, you're going to age the electrolyte over time. Even though this reaction is reversible, because it's a redox reaction, it doesn't completely go away. And at some point, you just essentially run out of the materials needed to perform the chemical reaction, and the sensor loses sensitivity and eventually dies. The other issue is that it's a very strong function of temperature, so it needs to be calibrated out for that continuously, and it's, of course, slow, because you have to wait for that diffusion of oxygen and then the chemical reaction to take place. But the advantage is that it's quite small, and it's extraordinarily sensitive, and it can have very, very good accuracy if it's used correctly, which is why they're using it in a device like this. Now, at the same time, you have to also be very careful if 
the air going inside is very acidic or has compounds that can create acidity, you will basically completely neutralize the potassium hydroxide, which is a base solution, and you can rapidly age the sensor and essentially destroy it. Now, whatever must have happened to this sensor in this unit is most likely just old and it has end of life. So we would have to replace it to see uh, what happens and hopefully that brings it back to life. Now, at the same time, if we take it apart completely, I want to see what's inside and if we can analyze any of the chemicals in there. So I want to take one of the ones that we have apart and look inside. But overall, really interesting and kind of straightforward technology. And it's amazing to see how many different ways there are to measure different chemicals. And here's the teardown of the sensor. It's quite destructive, of course, because it is fully sealed. So at the bottom, we do have the two electrodes going into the sensor itself. One of them is at the very bottom here, embedded in the material, and the other one sticks through and goes to the other side. And that's how the current flows between the two of them, and that's what you're trying to measure. Now, this could actually be made of platinum, or at least platinum plated, as it is quite common in these kind of sensors. And here's the rest of the material. This is what the oxygen reacts with. This, not the brown powder you see. This, there's some electrolyte in here. Sometimes it is potassium hydroxide. The rest of it must be some fillers or some other agents, or maybe catalysts of some kind that are in there. The oxygen diffuses through here and it goes through this other filter that sits on top and that's how it finds its way inside of the rest of this material. Now I do want to see if I can detect any of these base chemicals, something like the potassium hydroxide inside or not. So I scooped up some of it into this container and we're going to put it into the Raman spectroscopy machine and see if we can detect that material. But it's really cool to see inside of this. I'm not going to destroy the other sensors because they're all brand new but the principal operation and a lot of them are fairly similar. And here is Agilent and Raman Resolve with a Raman spectroscopy and the library is built in. We're going to take the sample here and put it in the vial holder and run a scan on it. If you haven't seen the video about this instrument, it is on my channel. A really cool video and a phenomenal piece of engineering. Definitely check it out. Let's see what it says. And check it out, there is potassium hydroxide in the sample as determined by the Raman spectroscopy. It's very cool to see that the theory does match what we're actually measuring. Now there's a few other compounds in there too as fillers and things that you can see in the teardown, but the actual electrolyte being potassium hydroxide is verified with the Raman scan. Let's do a simple experiment and see if we can measure the byproducts coming from burning of a candle. Here I have my thin foil hat that I used in my 5G video. So we're going to put that directly on top of the candle over here and the exhaust of the candle will come out of the top of this and then will be sucked in through the probe which is connected to the instrument. The unit has already been calibrated and is reading 20.9% of oxygen and zero on the carbon monoxide and the carbon dioxide. So let's try it. And here we go. There is our candle. And here is our cone. Let's see now. I also cover the top so that at least the majority of the exhaust is being fed into the unit. And check it out. We actually have some carbon monoxide, 26 parts per million, and then the CO2 concentration is now 0.4%. There's also a significant difference in the temperature between ambient and the fluid temperature, which is at the top of our exhaust, quite a bit, 132 degree Fahrenheit, which makes sense because all the heat is what is causing the actual flow of hot air coming out. Very cool that this is working. Now, th whether these numbers are exactly accurate or not, it's hard to know because I don't have a calibrated gas concentration. But the oxygen concentration also went down by about 0.7%, which makes sense because the candle is consuming it. Very cool. I'm curious if the printer works. I actually haven't tried it yet. And sure, one copy. Wow, it's printing all the data. Yep, it's basically what was on the screen, the delta of the temperature, the concentrations, and some notes. You can rip it up. That's kind of cool. Yeah, we have a complete report. So this is pretty useful because you can add this in the field to whatever survey document that you're making. Now there is one other thing I want to try. If you ever used one of these hot hands, these things are basically burning slowly. That's how they produce the heat. There is iron powder and charcoal inside, which is reacting with the oxygen and causing this heat in a controlled fashion so it doesn't burst into flame, which means that there must be some difference in the presence of oxygen and potentially CO2 around one of these. So why don't we put one of them on the sensor itself and see if it registers anything. And in fact, there is definitely an impact on the O2 concentration and there's presence of CO2, which is the result of the chemical reaction. And it is sitting 45 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient. It all works out and it all makes sense that that resource is of course needed to produce the heat. And you can even measure it with an instrument like this. Pretty cool. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this rather different video on the channel. I really like looking at many different kinds of instrumentation and bring diversity to the channel whenever possible. Thanks to all the Patreon and PayPal supporters. Of course, you're free to join them. If you'd like to support the channel, you guys all make this possible. See you in the comment section.